Good morning and welcome once more to this, our joint service of praise and worship for the linked congregations of Irvine, Relief Bourdieu Hill and Muir. We welcome you to the service and if you're a visitor for the first time and want to be kept advised of future services, please give us a like on Facebook or send us a message and we'll arrange for you to be linked in to the content of future services. And now, let us pray our opening prayer this morning. Lord and Master of all, we come to you today to surrender our lives once again as our act of reasonable service. We come acknowledging you as the one who has given us breath and has put your life-giving spirit within us. We come proclaiming that Jesus shall reign as our Saviour and Redeemer and rejoicing in his perfect sacrifice for all our sins. And we come in a repentant spirit, for we know that we have not loved you more than any other. We have not given you the place in our lives that is above all things. And we have worshipped the idols of this world, letting them control us and steal our freedom. Lord, in your great mercy, forgive us for these and all our sins. Create in us a right spirit, and renew our hearts in love for you. So grant us a fresh start, true to our words, committed to our vows, and living as though you really are our Lord and Master, in every way being like your Son, and shining with his radiant life. We ask it for Jesus' sake, who taught us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're well. I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. Now, just in case you think you've tuned into the wrong programme, Gardener's World, you haven't. I just want to talk to you about gardening and the opportunity we had during lockdown to sit in our garden or play in our garden. And it was nice sunshine as well. So that was lucky. But I decided 
that I was going to take it a step further and I bought some seeds. I bought all these little seeds, vegetable seeds and herb seeds and I planted them in my garden. And it's been great fun, as you can see, watching them growing. I got, here is a little parsley seed. Look at the size of it. And here is a little lettuce. They've still to grow quite a bit. But this sunflower, this lovely little sunflower, is coming on quite well, isn't it? But this big daddy, as you can see, he has grown enormous. That one's going to be six feet tall. And I've got some sweet peas. They're coming on great. I've got some beetroot. Look at my beetroot coming on. And I've got this nice tomato plant. Can't wait to get tomatoes from that. And when you look at the size of the seeds that you put in the ground, you wonder that they ever germinate. But they do. Look, oh. One's just rolled off there, but there's some peas on there and some lettuce and some chives. And it's amazing how they germinate and grow into nice plants. But you know, they all need the right conditions or they will never germinate. And what they need is water. They need a lot of water and they need sunshine. A lot of them need sunshine. Some flowers, some vegetables don't need sunshine. They need dark. Like potatoes need the dark to germinate. But if they don't have water and they don't have oxygen and they don't have the right conditions of sunlight or darkness and weeding, constant weeding, they will never germinate. They will never germinate and grow into what they're supposed to be. They need the right conditions. And sometimes, as we saw, the smallest seeds can have the biggest effect. And isn't that wonderful to know? You just think you're throwing something in and it'll never grow. And then all of a sudden, look at the size of some of the things you can get. They're beautiful and they're so exciting to grow. Now, do you know, our faith is a bit like that. So, to move that out the road. Our faith can be a bit like that. If it's not nurtured, our faith won't grow. If it's not germinated, we don't plant the seed of faith, it will never grow. But just like planting the smallest seed, sometimes they can have the biggest effect. So we shouldn't worry about the size of our faith, as long as we have faith. And that means that we put our trust in God, who sent his only son to die on the cross and to be raised three days later, so that we could have life everlasting and we could have all our sins forgiven. Isn't that wonderful to know? So let's keep loving Jesus. And remember, you have to forgive others. You love others, so you forgive others. That's a hard thing to do, but that's part of the deal. So let's put our trust in God to grow our faith a little more each and every day. Now, why don't you try growing some vegetables? It's easy. All we need to do is give them the right conditions and even the smallest seeds can have the biggest effect. And when you grow them, just remember, your faith can do exactly the same thing. Even a little faith can grow a lot. We all have enough for God to be working on. And that's what he's doing each and every day. If we put our trust in God through Jesus, he will nurture us in our faith and we will grow a little each and every day. Well it's been great talking to you today boys and girls and I hope to see you again soon. Until then, from me and my plants, bye bye. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Luke chapter 17 verses 1 to 10. Sin. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that make people fall into sin are bound to happen, but how terrible for the one who makes them happen. It would be better for him if a large millstone were tied round his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch what you do. If your brother sins, 
rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in one day, and each time he comes to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Faith The apostles said to the Lord, Make our faith greater. The Lord answered, If you had faith as big as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Pull yourself up by the roots and plant yourself in the sea, and it would obey you. A servant's duty. Suppose one of you had a servant who is ploughing or looking after the sheep. When he comes in from the field, do you tell him to hurry and eat his meal? Of course not. Instead you say to him, Get my supper ready. Then put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may have your meal. The servant does not deserve thanks for obeying orders, does he? It is the same with you. When you have done all you have been told to do, say, We are ordinary servants. We have only done our duty. Amen. I belong to the generation that, unlike today's, had very few comments on their school report card. My most common comment was, could do better. There's a story of a mother who went into her daughter's bedroom and on her bed was lying a note. With the worst premonition, she picked it up and began to read it. Dear Mum, it is with regret and sorrow that I am telling you that I have eloped with my new boyfriend. I have found real love and passion and he is so nice with all his tattoos and piercings and his big motorcycle. But it's not only that, Mum, I'm pregnant. But my boyfriend said he'd be very happy we'd be very happy in his trailer in the woods. He wants to have many more children with me, and that's one of my dreams. I've learned that marijuana doesn't hurt anyone, and we'll be growing it for our friends who are providing us with all the cocaine that we need. In the meantime, please pray for signs to discover a cure for AIDS, for my boyfriend to get better. He deserves it. Don't worry, Mum. I'm 15 years old now and I'm able to take care of myself. Someday I'll visit so that you can get to know your grandchildren. Your loving daughter, Judith. P.S. Mum, none of this is true. I'm at a neighbour's house. I just wanted to show you that there are worse things in life than my report card, which is in my desk drawer. Well, the Gospel of Jesus is not a report card that says, could do better. It's a divine inspiration and encouragement to find life, real life. It's good news, not bad news. During the lockdown, many found time heavy on their hands. Some said they're just killing time. But one writer said, that is to commit suicide by degrees, because you plus your time equals your life, and you just have one life, and it can't be wasted. The good news is that God can give you fullness of life with no killing time and no filling time either, but living time. The gospel convinces all people that they have potential. Tell a kid that, and they're energized, but all, of whatever age, if they have faith, have within them what it takes to be much more than they are. We read today the parable of the mustard seed. In it, Jesus tells us, although faith is the smallest of seeds, it can grow to have the biggest effect. It just needs the right conditions in which to grow. Now think about this. No one can say that they are a little bit pregnant. Similarly, there is no such thing as a little bit faith. One writer has put it this way, faith is an overwhelming power, no matter how weak and unshowing it may seem. Given half a chance, 
It will take over and direct our lives, comforting us when we are discouraged and challenging us when we are complacent. Let me show you just one aspect of living by faith. You become much more forgiving than you've ever been. The disciples were told to forgive a brother seven times, even in a single day. This is quite astonishing to them, since the rabbis had taught them just to forgive three times. So Jesus had doubled that and added one. He later told them to forgive 70 times seven times. The point is that Christian forgiveness far exceeds the best the world can achieve. A person who is growing in faith will grow in the ability to forgive and forget. And that's a very freeing experience. If we want to grow, we have to practice forgiveness. It's hard at first, but it's easier once we understand just how much we have been given for all we have done to hurt God and others. That makes it so much easier to go out and forgive. The alternative is to be all screwed up with anger and bitterness. That just wrecks life. If we approach something like forgiveness saying, it can't be done, then it won't be done. But if life by faith we say, it must be done, then it probably will. God delights to give more faith to those who will use it, whether to forgive or to do things that seem impossible. Jesus shocked his disciples by the breadth of his forgiveness and by the extent of his faith. He has planted his seed within us. He is living in here, and we all have the potential to grow into something magnificent for him. We can't let others say to us, oh, you'll never amount to anything much. The devil wants us to believe that kind of lie he wants to restrict our lives. Jesus wants to grow our lives. And we can do so by committing ourselves to be his servants and to do what he wishes. That's all that's required for the whole process to germinate and grow into that powerful force that enriches so much of our lives. He's not looking for great overblown gestures, but humble service. You don't have to run around like a headless chicken, trying to do as much as you possibly can. You just have to do what you're called to do. You don't have to go off to some jungle to convert some tribe. You have to fulfill the unique and God-given purpose that he has for you. So isn't that good news? But it actually gets better. For this means you can stop comparing yourselves to others and get on with living out the faith in the way that you're meant to do it. If you're a single mum, you have to stop wishing you had the stuff that married folk have and get on with the privilege of rearing your child in the way that God would want. And that's a high privilege. If you're a service worker, you have to stop wishing you were a manager and get on with the privilege of being God's person in the area of service that he has for you just now. Jesus was a servant, and he has elevated service to the highest rank of all. Just do what he calls you to do. Do it well, and know that's exactly what he wants from your life. You don't need fame or fortune, just faith. And if you love him, then that's the perfect response to his love for you. And that's all he wants. Once upon a time, it was a mother's 50th birthday. Oh, horror of horrors for a woman to be 50. Her children, who loved her very much, were determined to make that birthday truly spectacular. They rented a hall, hired an orchestra, invited a huge crowd, and ordered dinner from the best caterer in town. Each one of them gave a little speech about how wonderful their mother was. So hard did they work to make the party a complete success that they wore themselves out and they bickered throughout the whole evening. Each one tried to outdo the others 
in professing love for their wonderful mother. The mother cried throughout the whole party. She was so happy. Well, said her husband, after it was all over, now you know how much your children love you. Oh, she said with a sigh, I knew that all along. They didn't have to prove it to me. I'm very grateful. Still, wouldn't have it have been much nicer if it was only you and me and them sitting around a table and enjoying ourselves and the love we all have for one another? The response of love doesn't have to be overblown. That's Jesus' point in these verses about being unworthy servants. Loving him and doing that by being obedient servants, living by faith, is enough. Now isn't that a whole lot better than hearing a series of shoulds and could do betters? The gospel is good news. It's God's gift to enrich our lives, to bring us to our full potential and to find the awesome power of the seed of faith. And may you find it. And may God bless you and nourish you in it. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Lord, what can we give to you that you have not already given to us? We thank you that we can give our hearts in devotion, our actions in service, and our resources as a means of extending your kingdom. So today, receive all our offerings of whatever kind to strengthen the work of our churches, to extend our pastoral care, to sustain the preaching of the word, to be in our communities as a shining light of hope. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Let's come together once more for our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Lord our Saviour, we rejoice that we have a God who has come to our world and knows all about our human struggles, hurts, pains and weaknesses. You know what pulls us down and makes our lives unhappy. You know what limits our enjoyment and crushes our sense of fulfilment and leads us to question our faith and our purpose in life. Yet, in and through it all, you know how to bring us joy, hope and your abundant love. So we pray this day for folks known to us who need our understanding. Many with behavioural and relationship issues, stresses and strains in their lives that wreck their joy, pressures that are too great for them, loss of hope, low feelings, anxiety about their businesses or about finding a job, and about supporting their family. Lord, you know all that they are going through. May our prayers, our listening ear, and our compassion be the help that they need to get them through this difficult time. Hear us as we intercede for them, and may we see the sunshine in their lives once again. We remember those who are seeking healing of body or of mind, remembering those who are still suffering from the coronavirus and its aftermath, those with cancer, anxious about their treatment, those with all kinds of illnesses whose treatment has been paused due to the focus on the pandemic. Lord, the healer and the Prince of Peace, may you bring your light of hope into their lives and let them find assurance and certainty in trusting you for their future. We pray for the most vulnerable in our world, the millions of children who die each year of hunger and disease, remembering the plight of so many in the Yemen and in other places of war and violence. We pray for the world's poor, living in a day and age when the price of a rich person's shoes would feed a whole village for a year, when the price of a rich person's toilet would build many homes for the homeless, when the price of a rich person's car would provide transport to work for hundreds. Lord, it is an ill-divided world. God of justice, make us more aware of our privilege and not just aware, make us act to help to bring help to the disadvantaged, the marginalised and the disregarded. We pray for those grieving that in their loneliness and emptiness they would find your quiet spirit in their lives as their close companion and friend. Lord, may your kingdom come and may we be those who help to bring it in, that the hungry may be fed, the naked clothed, 
the prisoners visited, the lost found, and the grieving comforted. We ask for all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now before our closing hymn, Gordon will give us the intimations for this week. We are pleased that both congregations are now operating an hour of prayer once a week in Muir on Tuesday between 2 and 3 and in Relief on Thursday between 2 and 3 for those who wish to indulge in private prayer in the sanctuary of each church. Also, um, we have the normal happy hour running on Facebook this coming Wednesday between 2 and 3 p.m. for those who would like some company and wish to join us through Facebook at that time. Now let us proceed with our service of worship today. And now the benediction. May our God who loves you and embraces you as his child bring you all the grace that you need to cope with everything in this coming week, knowing that his grace is sufficient for you. So may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and with all whom you love throughout this day and forevermore.